Chris Christopher on the origins of the Sumerians, part one. The origins of the Sumerians can be best explained in two forms. Let's start on who the Sumerians were and why do we care? The Sumerians, a culture and society shrouded in mystery and speculation. However, the question that must be asked, why do we care? And why do we care about the mystery of their origins? The world's first form of writing, its origins and the reason why it came about is a main thing we have to ask today. Writing, an achievement that we take for granted in a modern day society. But why and how did it start? Modern day Iraq is home to some of the most ancient civilizations with Sumer and the Ubaid tribe being the oldest. This pragmatic and gifted culture must be explored further in order to understand why this happened. In this presentation, we'll be also be exploring the Sumerian educational system as this gives us a glimpse into the mindset of this ancient race. In a modern middle school, we are taught the basics of the Sumerians. However, from that time, we are given no other information in order to pursue this avenue. However, even this basic information lacks the reason and the ideas of why the Sumerians came about and um, how they developed writing in the first instance. We shall endeavor to explain how writing was developed and the reasons behind it. And then once we have established that, we'll have some sort of understanding and we'll then explain the possible origins of the Sumers from the viewpoint of an amateur Sumerologist. The Sumerians, who, what, and where? In the first instance, what we call the Sumerians and the land of Sumer is not the original name of the people and of the region of southern Iraq. Spanning from the most northern city, that of Urim, to the most north southern point of Eridu. However, we simply know the former city of Ur, pronounced as Ur. However, this is the Semitic name of the city, which literally means dog, with the original Sumerian name of that city being Urim. Please see the tablets of, ironically named of Ur Namu, i.e. Lugal Kish, Lugal Urim. The actual word Sumer was an Assyrian name given to the peoples of southern Iraq, with the true name of this land referred by the inhabitants of Sumer as Ki Enger, the land of the lords. In addition, the Sumers referred to themselves as the blackheads, possibly for the reason that they were dark haired, much like Iraqis are today. However, the reason for this is still yet to be proven. But for the sake of clarity, we shall henceforth refer to the inhabitants of this region as Sumerian. The Ubaid period. At around 5,600 to 4,500 BCE, the original inhabitants of the region, of the southern region of Iraq, were the Ubaid tribe, as far as we are aware, of which are named after the local mound Tel Ubaid, where the culture was first discovered. This society had basic pottery and developed the potter's wheel, even though this is often incorrectly attributed to the Sumerians. This tribe lived in crude villages, in comparison to Sumerian standards, and were often subject to the flooding in the, of the marshes and of the Tigris rivers during the winter, with a drought during the summer. Arable farmland was scarce at this time, and population growth was very limited, in addition to the de development of pottery for this reason. The first Sumerian cities. In 4,500 BCE, everything changed with the entrance of the Sumerian tribe. Their original origins have been postulated, of which we will explore later. But in truth, their true beginnings are currently unknown. When we refer to the year 4000 BCE, 
We know that this is a time the Ubai tribe was eventually supplanted and pushed to a more northerly region with the descendants of the Ubaid civilization known as the Marsh Arabs today. At this time, we see the formation of the first cities, with Eredo being the first. However, in truth, the beginnings of the first city, that being of the aforementioned Eredo, being of Ubaid in, or- in origin, as even the Sumas themselves were of the opinion that the city's origins began at around 5,600 BCE, with necessity being the mother of invention, an explosion of ideas occurred at this time, and the first cities began by one simple idea, and that was to protect arable farmland from rival villages and townships. To protect the aforementioned uh, farmland, crude walls were built around these proto-cities the time of irrigation farming. Moving on to the year 3800 BCE, irrigation farming was uh, discovered by the use of canals dug from the Indigna and the Brananano rivers. These are the original Sumerian names of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. I'll repeat that, the Indigna and the Brananano, and was looked after by the inhabitants. Maintaining these was such a central part of their culture that the king, Lugal, the literal translation means big or great man, or even the Ensi, Lord Priest of the city, often worked as part of the community in order to clear the black silt and moss from the canals. Now, the silt we're talking about, we're talking about um, flora spa and quartz. An explanation of this this will be further explored in a further presentation. At this time, not only barley and dates were cultivated, but most shocking of all, poppies and their their seeds were first originally cultivated in ancient Sumer. Most think they originally came from China. However, this would be inaccurate, as they were first grown in ancient Sumer and much later sent on the seaborne trade route to China. The forerunner to opium was also used in the land of Sumer and was referred to as Hul Gil, in other words, joy plant or flower of joy. It was used for their many of their religious ceremonies, with the most notable being the Bit Ikitu festival. At the same time, as a formation of irrigation farming, Alcohol was first fermented, and the use of barley bread, known as bapia, was first used. This crude form of alcohol was made by crumbling pieces of bapia into water to form the first form of beer. For this was the common staple diet for the common man uh, in ancient Sumer, and, so, and it was so much a so important part of their lives. They had a goddess of brewing called. Ninkasi, literally translated as lady who fills the mouth. However, later the Sumas would develop a much more potent version of alcohol by the use of bapia mixed with the juice of dates. Clay tokens and accounting. With all these new developments, one needed a system of accounting of who owned what, of uh, which product and how many. Clay tokens were used, though there is some evidence that the first use of these were much earlier, with the impression of the product, essentially an image for each item, was stamped on a clay coin. An impress, for example, an impression of a sheep was used on a clay token to signify that this person owned one sheep. And this token was kept in a clay wallet called a bula. This was a great way of keeping track of who owned what. However, it was not very good at how many. The reason for this is if one had 500 sheep, 50 pots of beer, and 30 cows, then it stands to reason that one could not walk around with all these tokens, especially if you lose one of them. And with the addition of all that sheer weight of all that clay. 
Later, a system of showing who owned what and how many was used, essentially a way of impressing the same image, but in shorthand, so to speak, by the use of a wedge. However, instead of making the sign of a sheep three times to represent three items, the scribes used the sign for a sheep, which eventually became just a wedge to denote quantity. A wedge came to represent one and a circle to denote 10. So to write five sheep, the scribe impresses a wedge five times and then makes the sign for a sheep. However, we are only at the basic beginnings of the Sumerian form of writing. And that, that was around about 3500 BCE. Things started to change for the better. To understand the Sumerian language and its writing system, one must understand the mind of the Sumerian and how they saw the world. The Sumerian mindset and their views on life. To understand the early cuneiform, one had, as I previously explained, to think like a Sumerian. For example, the Sumer Sumerian sign for the concept Kua was originally an image for a mountain. However, it also meant whole land, with the addition that it was the same sign for the never world, the afterlife, or as a more modern individual would see it, as the underworld. It was also the sign and name for the east wind. At first glance, one would not be able to fathom why the same sign could mean, have so many differing concepts. However, if one understands the Sumerian mind, then the connection becomes apparent. Between modern day Iraq, Sumer, and Iran, Elam, are the Zagros Mountains. The Elamites from Iran used to attack the plains of Sumer through these mountains, so much so that the mountains became associated naturally with death and danger and the afterlife, as well as the concept of land and mountain. To emphasize this, to emphasize this viewpoint, the Sumerians had a goddess called Ninkursag, literally meaning Lady Mountainhead. Later, the name was changed slightly to Ninhursag. And the other few examples of this trail of thought would be the sign for Munos, or woman, was literally a loose drawing of the female genitalia area. That is a triangle with its apex pointing down and a line drawn to the center from the triangle from the apex. Another would be the concept of God, gods, heaven, the gods of heaven, the heavens, Anur. This concept is easy to understand and its connections. The sign for this is the asterisk or the eight red star. In Sumerian, this concept is called Dinger. Later in Sumer, two dialects would evolve in regards to the female and male dialects. This is around the time of 2500 BCE when the influence of the Akkadians in, in the north became more apparent. The former being Emesal and the latter Imugal, for example, if a Sumerian male scholar wrote about a goddess, then he would change from the male into the female dialect, even though the writer was male. Further information that is not tutored in an American junior high school is that Sumerian writing was heavily enforced in Sumerian schools. Each student had to labor in their work from sunrise to sunset, and mistakes were not tolerated in the least. Whilst good work was actively praised, poor work was punished severely. A Sumerian scribe had to prepare the clay tablet to the correct consistency beforehand and to exactly copy the text that was prepared for them by the teacher called the school father. Failure to do so merited a beating by the class monitor, then by the teacher, 
and then finally by the principle of the whole Sumerian school. A Sumerian school life was a hard one. However, this was justified by the fact that these scribes were entrusted with high offices later in life. Now that we've discussed who the Sumerians were and why should we care about them, that is, we care because of their achievements that still stand and are largely relevant even today. However, let us further explore the possible origins of the Sumerian peoples. <laughs>